are Seraphim. Welcome to Generation Space, the podcast by Seraphim. In this episode, we'll discuss how space and space technology can help solve some of the world's most pressing problems like climate change, food security, and sustainability. Space is ubiquitous. In the digital world, and thanks to the growing space tech development with satellites, AI technology, IoT and robotics, our planet is becoming connected via space and in space. Humanity is already dependent on space in so many ways and will be instrumental in driving towards net zero. Today, you'll be hearing from Sarah from Investment Vice President Maureen Haverty. Hi, Leah. Maureen joined our team last year, having been COO at Apollo Fusion. And this week, I'm delighted to welcome two of our portfolio CEOs, including Anthony Baker, CEO of Satellite View. Hi, good to be here. And last but not least, we're joined by the CEO of Crop Monitoring Service, Planet Watchers, Dominic Edmonds. Very pleasant to be here. Thank you very much. Maureen, I'd like to go to you first. How does space tech have the potential to improve our lives here on Earth? I think that space has a couple of things about it that are really unique and quite useful for for improving life on Earth. So first of all, space allows you to be both global and local. So global is really important for something like communications. You can have continuous coverage. And then local, you can get down to something really precise, like a farm or even a specific field. With global and communications with space, there's a lot of companies that are working on delivering connectivity from space to communities that probably wouldn't have it normally. So poorer communities, more isolated communities. And we think that's really important to deliver connectivity to increase innovation and reduce poverty. For something like local, we have lots of different ways of looking at the earth now that can actually help you detect emission leaks, help farmers improve crop yields, or help ships navigate better, all of which will further our work on climate change and reduce hunger. But I'm sure that both Anthony and Dom will be able to speak a bit more about that. Secondly, I think it's really important that with satellites, you can't lie to satellite observation. So it's really useful for checking whether people are doing what they say they're doing. For example, really we detect deforestation now using satellite imagery. So it's really good for holding people to account, which is obviously essential for meeting those climate goals. Um, Fantastic. So this is all things that are happening in in the near term. What about in, in the future? We hope the space will be able to do a lot of things, really. There's some really exciting stuff that's going to happen in the in-space economy. One of the really cool things that will help life on Earth are improved life sciences from space. So improved drug delivery or tissue growth and growing organs in space that really have the potential to really improve health on Earth. Wow, amazing. I think something that we say at Seraphim, we've linked a lot of our portfolio companies to the UN SDGs, the Sustainability Goals. Can most satellite companies or space companies, space tech companies be related to these? I certainly think a lot of the new generation of space companies are really focused on climate. I think people who are involved in space tend to be tree huggers anyway. They've always been interested in science. They've always been kind of interested in planet Earth. So there's definitely that. And obviously there's just a a growing interest from all startups on focusing on climate change. Amazing. Thank you, Maureen. I'm sure everyone's really excited to hear from um, our two guests today. Anthony, I'll I'll go to you. Can you tell us a little bit about Satellite View and how how that's working towards climate change? Yes, definitely. Satellite View is an Earth observation company. So we are going to be launching cameras into space that uh, are quite unique. So they're very high-resolution infrared cameras, so they can measure thermal signatures. And we'll be able to measure any structure on the world, right down to the building level. Right now, the sensors are available for weather satellites. Look at maybe postcodes so they can tell you if this area is warm or, or not. But we're looking right down at the, at the effects of man on the planet. So where are we wasting energy, which is very pertinent at the moment with, on a cold day in London. So with this data, customers can uh, identify which building on the street is, is the worst insulated. And people can go and fix that, so they save themselves uh, money in energy costs, but also on, on their carbon footprint. Yeah, this sounds like critical days are during like, the crisis like that we're living in at the moment. Absolutely, and there's many, many other applications as well. So we can look at uh, economic activities, see if this factory in the Far East is, is as green as it might says it is, so people can address issues around their, their, their scope three, their, their supply chains. So this is really important because companies are all declaring net zero, but they don't quite know how to, how to measure that and report it. And now we have a, a new data set that can help them report accurately. 
which is uh, prevents things which, which is called uh, greenwashing, where people are overstating that their, their claims are, of being green. I think that's a really good example of you just can't lie to satellites. And as companies become more and more responsible for everyone down their supply chain, and if a CEO of a major corporation is responsible for bad actors in their supply chain, satellites allow them to verify what they're being told by people on the ground. Exactly right. And the great thing about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to launch uh, eight satellites, first one in June this year on SpaceX, um, and then the following one in, in January, and then a, an, another six after that. So with the constellation, we can give very regular updates. So throughout the day and night, so because activity occurs day and night, and infrared can see just as well in, in the nighttime as, uh, as the daytime. And it gives that independent view. And it's the same instrument whether it's a, a factory in Beijing, your headquarters in London, or your distribution in, in San Francisco. And that consistency of data is something which cannot be reproduced with other methods like drones or planes, etc. So it's independent, it's consistent, it's repeatable. That data set is not available anywhere else except from space. Wow, amazing. I've heard, I've heard um, you've been called the, the world's thermometer. Yeah, no, this is a nice tagline for us because... Yeah, we, we, we measure the temperature of, of anything. It's the first independent measurement which, combined with other data sources, helps with validation of, of data. So we, we mentioned the uh, thermal upgrade. There's been s s quite a lot of dishonesty in that. So people have taken insulation grants and not spent it on the right purpose. So we can look at a building before it's insulated, and then after the work's done, we can verify. So if you're... Uh, an investment fund claiming to be green and make sure that your money is being used in a wise way. So again, it's going back to catching those bad actors. But you mentioned investment funds, but what other kind of industries are you disrupting potentially? So we've been looking at uh, pollution into the sea. So quite often uh, factories have a license to use the local water for cooling processes, whether it's nuclear power or petroleum refineries or, or glass factories. And it has an impact of releasing this warm water into the, into the uh, riverways. And as the ambient temperature is going up because of climate change, that impact is so much larger than it was anticipated. And so we can see this from space. One, to make sure that they're releasing the right temperature of water and the right volume, but secondly, that impact. Fantastic. Fascinating stuff, Anthony. I think now we'll go over to Dom. Dom, would you mind telling us a little bit about Planet Watchers? So in simple terms, Planet Watch's single goal is to tell the story of the field. But I want to almost step back to explain the business a little further. So we think about food production supply chain. It's very broad. There are a number of different factors in it, a number of different investments, businesses, etc. But we focused on a very specific niche market within that being the world of crop insurance. I say niche market, it's actually an incredibly large market. In the US alone, it's $17 billion worth of premiums every year. 220 million acres of the four biggest crops so there's a ton going on there but if you look again at the US in the past five years we've seen the number of billion dollar weather events increase by 115 percent meaning that there are more weather events impacting crops there are more farmers putting in claims there are more claims being paid out by insurers there's real pressure here and certainly in the US as crop insurance is subsidized by the US government that is taxpayer money going into crop insurance. Efficiency is really, really important. So what we're able to do is automate the data capture associated with collecting policy data. So what was planted, where it was planted, when it was planted, how much, and also automating the adjustment process. So instead of sending an adjuster to the field to walk that corner of the field, to extrapolate a number. And bear in mind when I say the field, here in the UK, we tend to think of what you could see out of your window if you live in the countryside. We could be talking 500 acres worth of field. You just can't do that on your feet. And truthfully, you can't do it across the full 220 million acres with a drone or any other data capture process. So again, like Anthony says, this has to be done from space. And we rely heavily on the use of synthetic aperture radar, or SAR for short, which allows us to cut through the cloud cover issue which exists. You know, someone like Iowa has 50% cloud cover on an annual basis. So we can actually see and track what's going on in the fields which allows us to then impact the bottom lines of our customers, so reduce their overheads, increase their accuracy, and save a ton of time along the way. And when you say your customers? Our customers are the crop insurers. To be clear, it's, it sometimes comes confusing to think that we're selling something to farmers. Farmers have a really busy day job. 
They don't need us knocking on their door to tell them to use another app for whatever it may be. We're here to focus on the greatest impact that we can make. And when you look at a crop insurer in the US, one of the larger ones might have more than 30 million acres uh, in their portfolio. By winning one single customer, we can then provide ourselves with 30 million acres rather than knocking on every single door to get there. So from a, from a climate and sustainability perspective, how is this directly impacting? Yeah, the direct impact, firstly, is obviously anything impacting crops impacts the food production supply chain. So having visibility of what's happened is really important. A neat-ish soundbite, I would say, is when the direct show of 2020 hit the US. A direct show is a type of storm. We hear the word hurricane and so forth. It hits Iowa and Illinois overnight. The first estimate from the USDA was that 14 million acres had been damaged. They came up with that estimate within like two weeks of the event. A month later, the economists dropped that estimate to 10 million acres. A month later, McKinsey dropped that down to, I believe it was four to five million acres. And then two and a half months later, NASA Harvest said that's about two million acres. A handful of days after the event, our analysis said it's 1.25 million acres. So oh. when you start to designate not just the funds, but the impact on the food production supply chain, you need to have real data that matters, not just finger to the wind. Every field, field's been flattened. We can't make this work. But we've also now started um, developing our technologies around uh, tracking the tillage process. So tillage is the turning of soil. Uh, when you turn the soil, you release carbon into the atmosphere. That's bad. And the use of cover crops. A cover crop is a, effectively a crop which is planted, which isn't harvested which absorbs carbon from the atmosphere in the off-season, so that's good. So we can detect the presence of cover crops and we can detect when farms are tilling the soil as well. Well, fascinating stuff. Maureen, just going back to you, why, as an investor, are you finding companies that are targeting climate, communications and sustainability? So climate and sustainability are obviously enormous problems. I'll focus a little bit on climate first and why we're looking at that as investors. So with climate, there are two aspects companies and the world in general, we want to reduce our emissions to reduce the amount of climate change that's going to happen. But also, very unfortunately, climate change is happening. So we need to future-proof ourselves and mitigate some of the impacts of that. So with more weather events, we're going to have more crop failures and trying to ensure against that. So we can see that with you know, satellite views helping people reduce their emissions and Planet Watchers is helping people you know, deal with the fact that climate change is happening. The thing is, is that obviously as investors, we're trying to maximize returns for our investors. And with these two factors, there's honestly a lot of money pumping into the area. And we want to target startups that are capitalizing on that and, that, and can help us with our climate goals at the same time. So there are a couple of really exciting trends, I think, in space um, that are happening and are all part of this. There are lots of companies that are generating space data right now. And then other companies that are using that space data and building products around that. So the first and really most exciting thing is that you don't need to send anything to space to be a space company and to have your entire product built around space. And that's great because it means that people who find problems can just use space to solve that rather than being the kind of company that has a solution and then goes searching for a problem. That's the first thing. But there's two kind of areas I think that are important for sustainability that we're seeing some exciting trends in. So in terms of, I spoke earlier about improved internet connectivity and that being really important to reduce poverty. As an investor, we're seeing lots of different companies trying to solve what's called narrowband communication. So that's the kind of stuff that serves IoT, so let's say cattle collars, you know, to tracking your cattle management or direct to sell in remote areas or even emergency beacons. So really important stuff that if, until it's solved, you're going to have a real problem with lack of innovation in those areas. But those companies are all targeting solving that same problem in really different ways. Some are launching their own low earth constellation. Some are using geosatellites that are already there. Some of them are using standard protocols. Some of them are using custom protocols. And then some of them are working with telecom companies and some of them are going alone. And as an investor, our job is to work out what actually is the best approach and that's going to win the market and it's going to generate the maximum returns with those companies. So that all forms part of your go-to-market. And then another thing that we need to ex consider as global investors, and this relates to kind of climate, 
is that the right go to market varies across the world. So Dom mentioned working with uh, farmers in the US. There are huge farms um, that are typically well funded. And the go to market dealing with those kind of farms might be very different for the go to market dealing with someone who's working with African smallholders and you know, a huge number of the world's population are fed by smallholder farms. So you might have a different approach for dealing with both of those. And we need to look at how people might use the same technology but approach the market in different ways. Fantastic. So what kind of companies you know, are exciting you at the moment? What have you seen out there, guys, that you, know, that you might want to mention in, your, in the ecosystem? You mean on top of satellite? I mean, I'm sitting next to him. He's not going to say it himself, <laughs> but it is pretty cool, let's be clear. I was going to say present company accepted. <laughs> but a serious answer, mm-hmm. I'm interested in this solar in space. Okay, tell us more. The idea is now that uh, solar farms can generate electricity, but the problem with the UK, we've got clouds, it's dark half the day, and the challenge for, for the energy system is that base always on supply. So there's not a very green way to do it. If you think nuclear is green, that is one way of doing it. So why not put the solar panels in a place where its sun always shines? And so you can find places in space where the sun always shines and you can generate electricity there. Then you can beam it down into, uh, into somewhere rural and then convert it back into electricity and pump it in the grid. So it sounds like a, a hugely green way of doing things. Uh, it builds on a lot of technologies about building infrastructure in space. So on the face of it, it, it sounds like a fantastic idea. And my understanding is the UK is one of the leaders in this technology. Let's now go to Tom. What the, what's next for Planet Watchers? We obviously have a clear focus in terms of starting out with US and North America, so spreading up Nicanda as our customer base. But beyond that, we do want to roll out our services, South America, Europe, the rest of the world. But let's be clear, this is a business we're trying to run. And if you try and do everything at once, because what we do is very hard, we often skip over that, but actually understanding farming practices, what wheat looks like in one county can be very different to what it looks like in another county. When it's planted, different parts of the world, the growing conditions, etc. means that you retrain your models every time you go to a new territory effectively. So the large term goal is to absolutely run those services on a global scale. But right now, we know exactly who the customers are we need to win to lead the US market. Uh, we're already working with 45% of the market and pretty certain it'll be 100% of the market. It's just whether that's this year or next. So right now I'm fully focused on us reaching that full capacity and then extending beyond that. Amazing. Anthony, and you mentioned you're going to be launching some satellites. Tell us a little bit more about that. So this year we're launching in June uh, with SpaceX, hopefully from Florida. The satellite's going through final testing at the moment, so we're, we're all set for that. And we've ordered a second satellite as well and booked a launch vehicle for, for January. And hopefully uh, this year we're going to raise enough funds to uh, buy another six satellites. So it's full speed ahead at the moment. One thing, Anthony, that we often see that startups struggle with when they launch their own satellites is they then have to go and find a customer for that data afterwards. And maybe there's problems with the data or they made some incorrect decisions in the engineering process. Could you talk me through about what you've done at Satellite View? Yeah, so we're in 2023. The company was formed in 2016. Those early years were customer discovery. So what does the market look like today? What sensors are being used, optical, radar, other other sensors, maybe you pay for them or they're free from science satellites. Why are people not buying more of it and what would be really useful? And so it took a long time of talking to customers, partnering with some of these other providers. I was in the Middle East, so they weren't looking for... uh, outlets there and just really understanding what would move the dial and it's only in the last three years that we discovered that thermal infrared is really a a phenomenology that's missing and then we've looked at the applications there. When you have a new phenomenology you can look at the existing users of uh, thermal applications so some thermal drones and other applications and then you can think, what, what else can this solve? And that's what it really comes interesting because that, if you've picked the right market and we think there's something in financial services, that becomes exponential. And then the venture capitalists really like that. That whole lesson is, is valid across 
all early startups, not just in space, but especially in space. I think there's a lot of space business leaders who fall in love with their own technology because we can do something that other people can't. What we do, generally, can you solve a problem? And is it a problem that people want to pay for? When I walk through the door at Planet Watches, we could probably call ourselves a SAR business. What the hell's a SAR business? Now, realistically, the, no one cares about the ingredients. They care about what you're actually developing. So to switch that round to being able to save 40 to 80% of the time and ca- collecting data for customers, right, that, that's, that's a problem you can actually address. And I think starting with a problem that's very painful and using your technology to address that as satellite viewers, as plant watches are, is super important, not just the fact that it's cool and it sounds clever. I think that's really important that lots of startups suffer from this problem, but it's even worse in space. And I think one space, if you're particularly if you're launching satellites, these are very expensive mistakes to make. You know, you don't want to be tens of millions of dollars of investment in years of work, and then you find out that you've made some poor decisions. But also, if you compare it to something like software startups, there's lots of really simple, Mm -hmm. basic testing you can do before you start developing any software that's a little bit harder to do with space, where, you know, you do A-B testing, you do landing pages, you do like a lot of really basic little tests that don't cost you a lot of money, and then you decide to go and develop that software that customer discovery process that space startups are more focused on now, I think that's really important to try and replace all of the cheap things that you can do with software. And and what drives you, Dom, to continue to work at Planet Watches? A a number of things. Obviously, I come from a very, what you call, traditionally capitalist background in terms of being an entrepreneur and, and a founder and having run businesses before. But there is something about running a business which clearly has to be a business, has to make money, but can also have good impact on the planet itself you know it's nice to go to bed and sleep well at night on the back of that not that any CEO really sleeps that well at night anyway but let's just (laughs) pretend for for the audience that that's what happens but yeah I want to be able to see that the business can have a positive impact in terms of how it can generally track those environment related conditions support the the producers the insurers themselves but you know we're in this you know not for giggles we're in this to deliver a real business you know and that's hard it's especially hard when you look at the history of Planet Watches, where founded out of Israel, you know, ex-members of an elite Israeli military intelligence unit. I'm here in the UK, our customers are in the US, and the data we capture is from space for satellites we don't own. So if you want to pick a tough thing to do, this is it. But that's why I fell in love with the opportunity, because I'm a scrappy kind of guy. I, I like picking fights I'm not meant to win. So the minute I think we've got this licked, I'll get bored. But that seems like a long, long way off. <laughs> Maureen? Any final comments or questions for the for Dom or Anthony? Yeah, I just think that you both touched on something that's really interesting, that climate is such an enormous problem with so many different individual enormous problems within that. And it's really challenging for businesses and then for investors to work out which of the problems are, are right for venture investment, as in which of the problems are, are real problems, are going to make a real impact in the world, we can all you know, feel good about ourselves from being involved and fixing the problem. But actually, there's money to be made there. And then I guess something for us all to think about is for the problems that won't make money, but still need to be solved, you know, what are the funding mechanisms for that? And is that kind of governments? Is that charities? Uh, Is that academia? But really, you know, there's lots of stuff that we can do that's going to generate great returns for our investors, but also is, is going to have a really positive impact. So for a little bit of fun, we'll end on a, on a myth buster. Has, has anyone got a space myth that they've heard that, um, you know, they'd like to bust for our audience today? Well, it's not exactly a space myth, but space can help solve this and verify things. So what really irks me is that people think they can buy carbon offsets, just throw some money and somehow it credits and and lets them off their bad deeds of of releasing carbon. And it turns out that most of these offsets are, at best, very poor. They're not fit for purpose. And it's an unregulated business. And so I feel sorry, as we're trying to offset our emissions that we have, that there isn't an honest broker. And I think space can help out with this. No, I I agree with that. I think that there's probably two sides to it, as you, you rightly say. The actual offsetting process itself may not be the right one morally, certainly, because you use your wealth to 
offset your poor behavior. Uh, but as you say, when you're offsetting it with something that isn't proven, and there's been a ton of money and interest we've seen flow into the broad capture of sustainability in agriculture, lots of money, very little results. As you say, it's unregulated. There's a number of parties claiming to be able to do X or be able to do Y. But no one really at the end of it is paying for it. It's become a bit like the Wild West. Uh, we've certainly, through our tillage and cover crop pieces, been drawn into those conversations, which can be, from a business standpoint, very time consuming, very distracting, and lead to very little at the end of it, other than somebody patting themselves on the back for writing a report and not much else coming out of it. So there is definitely danger in the sustainability elements. And I agree that space is probably the closest to an answer on validating sustainable practices at scale and you know let's be clear scale is important here it's one thing to be able to validate at a very small scale but being able to do it large scale which is where the benefits really come from fascinating stuff thank you thanks for that thank you dom thank you anthony thank you maureen thanks for joining me today you've been listening to generation space the podcast by seraphim if you'd like to find out more about any of the topics covered today then check out our website We are Seraphim.